Om Shanti. So, welcome all of you. And as always, before we begin, we'll spend a minute in silence to invoke the presence of the Supreme Being. So welcome all of you to the Values for Life series and it's the episode 54. This is a historic episode because it's the first time we are having a dialogue between our two very eloquent speakers who actually don't need any introduction because they have been a part of our series since a long, long time, since the inception, I must say. But uh, let me just briefly introduce them. First, Brother Eric, all of you know, he's a very dear brother. He's the National Coordinator of Canada. And basically, he has, he has been teaching meditation, the Raj Yoga meditation, since the last almost 35 to 40 years. He had been previously working with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation for more than 35 years. And also currently, as we speak, he's a journalist and a producer and offering many TV programs within the French services. And our second speaker is Sister Jenna, who again is a very fond sister for all of us because she has been with us many times. She's the founder and director of the Brahma Kumaris Meditation Museum, which is located in the metropolitan Washington DC area. And all of us know that uh, she's also the host of the popular America Meditating radio show, and also the recipient of the President's Lifetime National Community Service Award. So as always, today's uh, <clears throat> value is all about freedom. It's a beautiful value because sometimes people don't understand the right perspective of freedom. So I'm sure both of them will give us the true meaning of what freedom is. So a poem for both of them. Today's guests are the ones whose experience is indeed extensive because their research into spirituality is indeed so very intensive. The soul consciousness that they practice is so very progressive, which leaves all the other souls feel very impressive. They are the Supreme's precious jewels, indeed so expensive who go into the depths of the knowledge to the very excessive. Their talks on each value, including today, are indeed so comprehensive that soothes the souls who were previously apprehensive. And now there remains no chance for us to be defensive and they shall be remembered indeed for generations to come successive. So uh, with this, I would now request Sister Anu today to please welcome both of them with flowers. Over to you, Sister Anu. Uh, yes, uh, let's uh, spotlight Sister Jenna. Thank you, Manoj brother. It is such a fortune to welcome such special guests. They're not guests, we all know them from heart. and. Um, they really enlighten us to live a meaningful life um, through their sharing of wisdom and themselves being examples. So today, uh, actually Sister Claudia uh, couldn't be with us uh, due to her personal scenarios. So on behalf of her and uh, uh, the whole team of Values for Life series and every participant Welcome, Sister Jenna, with this beautiful orange flower. <laughs> it is vibrant, just like you. You brighten our world with your very sweet and empowering energy. 
Thank you so much and welcome to our program. Thank you. Thank you. And for our very dear brother, Eric, we have this red rose. That's the <laughs> love from our hearts because you are our very sweet uh, senior brother from Canada. And um, we, uh, like you, thoroughly inspire, empower, and sustain us with uh, the love. And you are always there for us. Thank you, Eric Bhaiji. Welcome. Very, very happiest welcome to both of you. And we are looking forward. Sorry, Anu sister, I think brother Eric needs to be unmute. He's not the co-host, is he? Uh, please make him smile. Yeah, because he just mentioned. It's yeah. done, it's done. Thanks. I was wondering if I would stay in silence for the whole hour. Yes, so that's you. what I was thinking. <laughs> Can't be possible. So here you go. We are waiting to well, listen to you. Thank you, dear Anuji and Manojji. So nice to join the whole team again. I know it is a big team behind yeah. uh, every session. And I know everyone is working beautifully you know with love and dedication to bring those values in the forefront flowers are always lovely and that's why today i changed my perspective of the camera so that behind me you don't sit very well i don't know if i can take one out because they're so pretty but they're very special flowers of a plant that only gives flower i don't know every many years i've had it for 10 years and it's wow. the first time it's blooming completely it's because it's I'm here. It must, I was going to say, <laughs> it must be because the plant knew you were coming, Jenna. And I told the plant, it's about freedom. And so the oh. plant must have felt, let me show them what freedom is all about. So it just exploded with flowers. We don't see well in the picture, wow. but it's really, really beautiful. And since this thing it, lasts very long, let me take, okay. Are one. they jasmines? Are they jasmines? No, they're even more beautiful. Oh, wow. They're very rare. I've never seen those flowers. Yeah. So to you, Jenna, Thank but you. because you're free, yep. Thank you. Okay, you got it? Got it. <laughs> it's Thank in you. our side. It's on your side. Thank <laughs> you. Must be somewhere near your camera now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank but you. It reminds me. I have to tell you, when um, I first came to D.C., I was living in this house on Georgia Avenue, and there was... Um, asphalt and an air conditioned unit planted on top of this rose bush. And I was always struck at how sweet the fragrance of those roses were, despite the fact that everything was against it. The asphalt was thrown on it, the air conditioned unit was planted on top of it. And still it rose to the occasion where every year, Brother Eric and everyone, it gave us the sweetest, most fragrant roses. I remembered picking those roses on many, many Thursday mornings as my offering to the divine. And the fact that that rose, that plant you have has been around for so long and is flourishing, again, I don't know, it's a sign of love and perseverance and sort of never giving up. You know, one day it all emerges no matter what. You're right. Uh, before we go into full conversation, I want to say that normally I speak very fast and I speak French, but exceptionally I'll try to speak English and slow <laughs> because of course we have incredible team making sure we have translation. So this interpretation in so many languages, I see three, four, five, six, six languages at least being translated so thank you for you know the translation by the angel translators and we'll be mindful and try to not go too too fast so my dear dear friend jenna you know i thought i was going to ask you questions only today but then i realized it's a dialogue <laughs> so i'll be sharing too which is lovely but first i was thinking you know let's explore what comes to mind when we just hear the word freedom, what about you? What did was it a, a key word uh, when you came to you know this movement with meditation, raj yoga? What? How do you? What comes to your mind when you think of freedom? 
A few things. I mean, there's a physical freedom that I think many of us can identify with. Freedom of speech, for example, in the United States has taken an all time high in so many areas people are speaking up freely. Uh, we can see what's going on in Iran currently and in so many other countries around the world. So there's a physical freedom that I think we're very used to. And I think the freedom that we're trying to get used to is the freedom of the mind. I can't say that I've mastered it completely as yet, but I can sure tell you that I felt the sweetness of it, um, especially when I'm in that place of real true inner recognition. So there's a freedom of the mind that I know this is what we're really searching for, despite whatever our physical surroundings might be. And I can just say, when I'm having moments of freedom, there's a creative force that comes through me. I don't know about you, have you ever felt that before when you're feeling that, that deep sense of freedom, nothing, your, your own thoughts will not limit your thinking and something woof, powerful emerges from inside of you? It happens to me a lot. I have that image now that uh, what I identify with in freedom is a wilder expression as if I would be in the wilderness and suddenly yell, you know, so loud just to empty my lungs, I think, to the freedom with nature. So that's the picture that comes to mind at the moment, just being so happy to be free. I'm wondering what, for me, I, I hear what you're saying and I also connect the freedom of the heart. And I find, I'm wondering if sometimes is the mind going to set the heart free or is the heart going to set the mind free? You know what I mean? In a sense, like, am I in bondage or in lack of freedom because of my heart shrinking or my heart being poisoned with something? Or is my mind being poisoned? Oh, but both may be together. I think they're not sleeping together, but they are just, you know, not <laughs> they're not well together. together. They're sleeping together, but they're not in the same room. <laughs> they're awake together too. <laughs> the um, mind. You know, recently I had a little bit of a fallout with someone, and there was something about a choice that they made. And I remembered how it made me feel about my interpretation of them. And there was something that happened in me. There was a little division of my love for them, but it was actually a division of love for myself. But, you know, later on, you come to realize these things. But um, I think both are required, Eric. I think you can't heal your heart that might be in a few pieces at this stage of the game without both of you sitting in the room and having a dialogue and being very open about the thoughts and the feelings and the acceptance of things that you've been through. So I wouldn't weigh one over the other. I, I think I would bring both of my energies in the room, which I know that I have. There are times that I've put more responsibility on the, the head, the mind, the intellect. It depends on how you want to interpret it, because I think sometimes the head, the mind, or the intellect thirst for some kind of information for it to develop that trust again, to, to, to allow the heart to come in. And so um, sometimes that's just what I need. I need to feel the wisdom and the trust to let my heart come back into this relationship with myself and with others, even though I know that's the long route, because at the end of the day, love is love. Love is the greatest form of freedom. And it doesn't need an intellect or a mind or truth to remind it of it. It knows what it is. It's just me, our world inside, behind our eyes. We're still grappling with truth and illusion. So I think both in the room of your mind or both in the room of the soul are really needed to have a dialogue 
to build a better relationship. Mm. I like that idea of dialoguing the heart mm -hmm. and the mind. Yeah. You know, when I came to, when I was 21 and I discovered Burma Kumaris, I've always said for the past many years, two words for me were the key words that pulled me in that path of making effort and engaging my life into this um, process. And it was the word Raja, which I really, really liked. I love this little king in me or the sovereign or the, I like the royal, more like the royalty associated with it, not the gold palaces or anything. The word Raja was the key word, but the second one was freedom. Mm -hmm. And what to me was the driving force in my whole spiritual life, honestly, has always mm -hmm. been about freedom. I've always felt that if I had to describe the sign of success in completing my life, the word freedom would have to be there. And I would say that if I don't sense that freedom fully, I'm afraid that I may uh, consider my life to be not complete or not mm -hmm. fully successful. And I really find that freedom to me is, um, is a sign of um, my ability to see myself as who I am. Freedom from, you know, false perceptions or freedom from the effect of false perceptions. Like you were mentioning about having a situation with someone. But I find sometimes those situations are just a perspective. Yeah. We get caught up into a discussion or conversation or a process of making decision and egos are clashing, but we only see one side of the story, our story, our side of the story. And I find that this is sometimes what ties us in a bondage in a mind, but in a heart with the other person. And I've always felt that um, to me, this is one of my biggest thing that I keep feeling, you know, if I could be totally free and I don't know for you, if sometimes freedom is a process or if freedom is a declaration, <laughs> you know, like we make declaration in the countries, Canada in the, uh, how to call it in English, the Heim, the Heim, the national anthem, mm -hmm. the word freedom, we stand strong and free, you know, it's a very, very powerful word. And so I'm wondering sometimes if we, if we need to declare ourselves free to experience freedom <laughs> of it's a process and we have to be patient until we claim, like I see war sometimes before a country can claim freedom, they need to go through very powerful things, you know, war, treaties, agreements. What do you think? <laughs> don't, don't even get me started on those political or, no, no, really good. It's no, not, <laughs> yeah, not even political. It's just I feel so much about what's going on in the world right now. And even though I have the freedom of information that is revealed to me why everything is going on, I still can't help but feel a deep sense of empathy. And even at times, Eric and everyone, sometimes quite saddened by the unfolding of how we behave and we treat each other. But that's all a part of even a freedom to be able to express oneself or to feel the way that you want to feel. But going back to what Eric was sharing when he first came into the, this incredible space of freedom that the Brahma Kumaris offers us, I think I was 17, you know, when my parents first came onto this path. And I remembered seeing the way my mother and father started to treat each other. They had changed in the way they showed respect for each other. And when I came into my own awakening, the freedom I felt of no longer living my standards based on what the world wanted of me, but there was a freedom that came over me after the, the meeting on the mountaintop with this energy of the divine and the meeting of many souls who are working on themselves, the meeting of the love of God through my mother's eyes. 
there is a freedom in me that opened up that I can be the change that the world is looking for. And I remembered seeing that. And I remembered how important it was for me when I started to really study with the Brahma Kumais in their teachings. There was something connected to me where freedom was in service. And I remembered when I felt a bondage, when I felt hurt or bruised, was when I felt that I was being held back to initiate something that I thought would make the world into a better place. And I could feel the difference of being in a scenario where there were other people involved in your destiny and you believed in those people that they held the key to your destiny. And there is an energy in you that was coming up as if God's light was saying, go here, do this, make this happen. And whenever we would present it or I would present it, it was like, no, no. And many times when that would happen to me, I felt like I needed to find a freedom that was within me. And maybe that's why it just wouldn't be okay to do these things I felt free to do. And at some point in time, I think I felt that freedom. It was um, an acceptance. It was a sacrifice. It was an understanding. It was, it was an honor. It was something that was entrusted with me. And when I started to just launch forward with what I knew was undeniably the energy of God's light saying, let's go and do this. Let's make this happen. Let's give this out. And when I pushed out of that, Eric, and I didn't let my mind think there were people that had my destiny in their hands, and I had stopped allowing that bondage to hold me as a prisoner, wow. So the way that I had to work through that was I had to find freedom in myself first, to be comfortable enough to trust that um, what, was, what was really feeling as an initiation was really an anointing, was a blessing, was something that was really fixed in the destiny to occur. And I would feel that it was God's blessing that was moving this. This was no human being. So in essence, in my study of Raj Yoga, I would feel the freedom and service because there was just something that was being initiated and I just had to let that out of me. I felt like if I didn't allow that creativity to come through me, I would die. Mentally, spiritually, and physically, like, I can't kill this. This is not even me. I could feel it. And so I had to first work on my inner freedom in order to have been given the power of physical freedom. And I think everybody has to do that for themselves, whether you're in a marriage, in a job, in a country, where you feel like it's not giving you the freedom you deserve. You've got to work first on the inside to even understand the responsibility of your personal inner freedom. Yeah, that took some time, but um, I broke through it and I'm just yeah, so it's glad. Interesting. It's interesting because you're mentioning the freedom that was given to you. Yeah. But the freedom you also had to find for yourself. Yeah. In yourself. So it's like really there are two, uh, two dynamics, you know, on one hand, the, the frame or the box, but also the, the inner work. Is that what you're yeah. saying? Yeah. Yeah, I think we look at freedom quickly at a physical level, but I think on the path of spirituality and Raj Yoga, you have to look in the interior world of your freedom. Are you the one 
because of your past experiences, are you the one believing in those past experiences that are creating the bondage for you? Nobody can put you in a bondage. Only you can do that. So until you identify what those thought patterns are, how can you declare yourself free, even if you're in America, the land of the free and the home of the brave? You know, it's, I really enjoy this, uh, what you're sharing, because I think we're both saying in one way that when we joined a movement, which is fairly intense, you know, there's an intense spiritual practice, many big choices we make in our life in terms of our relationships and food and, you know, thinking, meditation, practice. And it reminds me of the latest uh, documentary I've produced for uh, for uh, the public television in Canada. We went in Nepal and we met this incredible woman who is very well known across the world. Her name is Ani Choing Drolma, which means sister Choing Drolma. And she's a nun, but actually her story is that when she was very young, she was beaten up by her dad very, very badly. And her mother was also being beaten very, very, very badly. And she was scared very often about uh, her mother being killed by her father. And when she was 13, one day her mother gave her the freedom by telling her, you don't have, this is not your story. You don't have to stay you know, in that story. And it gave her the courage to leave home, knowing she was abandoning her mother in the hands of a very violent father. But she had to leave because she was given that freedom. But she said, that's not the freedom I was thinking because mm -hmm. she felt guilty of leaving her mother. So when she left home at the age of 13, she went and searched um, for refuge in a monastery, a Buddhist monastery. And what she told us in the interview, she said, when I entered the monastery, that's the day I felt free. I felt freedom. And the journalist I was working with was thinking, wow, to me, that would be the opposite. <laughs> like <laughs> for us, my family, when they saw me coming to the Brahma Kumaris, they thought I was going to a religious jail, you know, like something comes training and, you know, the Sahara can, that's it. He's... He's in a spiritual jail, and the journalist felt that a woman to enter a Buddhist monastery, she's going in jail. <laughs> she's going in the, from his perspective. And from many people's perspective, certain aspects of a monastery lifestyle is not what they will um, think of when they think of freedom. And her interview is incredible because she shared her journey in doing exactly what you're describing, that she was given freedom. She was a very different person. She became a world-known singer, which normally Buddhist nun don't do. <laughs> you don't go on stage singing when you're a Buddhist nun. She became a public um, you know, figure in the world, uh, and she became an activist for women's rights in Nepal. And everyone knows her. She drives a four by four a Range Rover <laughs> as a Buddhist nun in Kathmandu. And she is she is a strong character. And she said at the beginning, the Buddhist um, order were a little bit shocked, you know, with what kind of new strange recruit we have here and what do we do with her? But because of their philosophy, they gave her the freedom to be different. And she said, but I had to find my own, exactly what you were sharing. She said, I had to also find my own freedom yeah. for her story with her mom and her dad. So she took strength from her religious practice to forgive her dad. And she told us something very powerful in the film when she said at the end of her dad's life, she had become his mother. Mm. With caring nature, forgiveness. Um, she accompanied her mother who died from kidney disease, not from her husband. And she, by her attitude, changed her father. And she said that when her father left 
the body, he was holding her hand and mm. he told her how fortunate he was to have a daughter who became his mother. And for her, she was, she was telling us, this is for me what my inner freedom became. Wow. When I set myself free from my past, from my guilt, from you know uh, my sufferings, but I was given freedom by my, her teachers, her masters, to do that and to go wild in the West <laughs> and sing on the stage. She sang with very famous people. Uh, she danced salsa. I don't know if you ever saw a Buddhist <laughs> nun dancing salsa, but it's not happening often. <laughs> so I feel this freedom as such a multifaceted oh, layer yes. that is oh, really yes. fascinating. I'm really wondering what I'm always thinking, you know, yeah, we can talk amongst us, but I'm hoping we can engage with people's heart, you know, listening and everyone here that I'm seeing, even our friend Manoj and Anu and everyone that our conversation should also help everyone to push the button of freedom. And I think your questions are good in terms of asking ourselves, are we holding on to something that, you know, refrains us from being free? And you can certainly even help me in that because I'm, I wouldn't say I'm free 100% today. I'm just aspiring for freedom. I'm, I'm, I know it's there. It's close. I sometimes feel I'm entering the bubble of freedom and I, I yeah. yell in nature and I say, yeah, I'm, I'm there. And then suddenly a big train passes, <laughs> hits me and say, oops, what was that? <laughs> Where does this train come from? I didn't, I didn't see it coming. And I'm back in emergency trying to yeah. understand what am I doing here now? And I've been hit by a train somehow. <laughs> yeah, that's what I love about these times, everyone. These are, if not to me, the best times we've ever had because what they're actually doing to us, we are now free to get out of the box and to think. I was in California last week and we were producing a, a PBS special on Yogananda's um, life. And I was there with this wonderful couple uh, who is the yogi for all the stars in LA and they were telling me about their surrender and their life of simplicity and living in ashrams in Kerala in India and when they come back to California it's just all the pomp and all of this and they're more you know into wanting to go and live the simple life and I just looked at them and I said but you can be spiritual in your pomp and splendor too they don't have anything it's easy for them to just live like that and her eyes popped open and looked at me. And why I'm saying this to you is that the truth of the journey of us as souls is upon us. And whether you enter into a monastery because your parents, your father was abusing you, or you enter into a monastery or a spiritual movement like we did, whether for me through my parents, for you through a flyer maybe, <laughs> or an interview on the, on the radio, that coming into that space, at that moment, it was the key in opening everything that you were questioning, seeking, looking for before that moment. And I think as we stay, as we stay in that space, who you're supposed to be and evolve into as an energy to serve the 8 billion souls in the world will be revealed. So who said that a Buddhist monk woman couldn't ride a four by four or be on the stage and sing? Because I've met many people who wear garbs and robes and beads and malas and collars and inside of them they want to be on that stage singing and inside of them they want to dress in a different way and inside of them they want to drive the lamborghini or the ferrari but on the external they're carrying an image that they now feel has become a bondage and not giving them the permission to express who they feel 
they are or can be at the moment. So again, I take everyone back to the interior work. That when you really listen, and I mean really listen to what those thoughts are telling you when you're in silence, or when you're in front of your spouse, or a colleague at work, or you're watching a great documentary or film, or you're just looking at somebody in the store or in your office. And when you can observe those thoughts, if those thoughts are really driven by a kind of a benevolence, a a, a love, an acceptance, an appreciation, an assistance, a gratitude, if that thought that you're having in front of that person or situation or circumstance is giving you that feeling, that's your freedom, you're doing the work. If for whatever reason you feel stuck, inhibited, afraid, in doubt, no confidence, inferior, there is a bondage there which only you can fix. And then you have to use a thought that you have to find in yourself. And my thought was, go to God, who I call Baba. Go there. There's an energy that is available for you. Because maybe you don't feel strong enough to believe enough. Go to God in your mind. Know that this God is the energy of everything true. And the more I let go of these attachments to my labels, I can feel God's energy. And I can catch that thought. And then that thought starts to release me from the bondage that I'm too used to. And Eric, when that happens, look out. Because I will also hop into a 4 by 4 and <laughs> ride that 4 by 4 like you would not believe. Don't forget, I used to race cars when I was younger. So getting into a race car right now is not unusual for me. And there would be nothing wrong with me to do that. If I did that, I would break your limitation of looking at me as a young woman in a white robe talking about God, that you've put me in a package that I don't belong. See me for my virtues, my courage, love, service, benevolence. Don't see the limits. Because that's what I'm working on breaking, and that's what everybody should break within themselves too. <laughs> you should send us pictures. I want to see you then. The, the, the salsa as well. <laughs> salsa but am I, I hearing... don't like. No, okay. But am I <laughs> hearing? You know, am I hearing something that I would, you know, resonate with when you say you listen to your thoughts? And of course, if you create or change your thoughts then in a way you create your freedom. For me, is it like, am I hearing if you create love, for example, a thought of love, then suddenly it changes. So is it that virtues, in a way, create our freedom? In a sense, love frees us from anger or hatred. Peace can free us from, uh, you know, uh, peacelessness, agitation, stress, whatever. So is that what I'm hearing that, the quality of your thoughts will set you free. Of course, and you and I know that better than anyone else in the Zoom room right now. But one Are of you the things, no, it is just that sometimes because I'm not used to feeling the freedom, I need to now raise the question. So, a question that I have asked myself to help me is what does love want of me now? One. <laughs> Second, what if. What if I did it differently? What is, what is on the other side of my fear or bondage? So those are two big questions that I've asked. When I'm feeling like my thoughts are not in check, Brother Eric, and I don't feel love or freedom, I'm actually feeling quite uncomfortable. And I know what discomfort feels at a soul level. I don't like it. So I'll ask myself, what does love want from you, Jen? Or... What's on the other side of this feeling? And somehow I get led back to freedom. And then you call yourself gem, not Jen. <laughs> <laughs> you become a real gem. <laughs> I hope you know, so. I it's think my so. Wish. I it's think my that's wish. 
And it's not even just me. I think it's my wish. I don't know if it's some soul journey that I have to go through, but I just want people to get along and to be good with each other. And it's funny because as I go through my journey, I bump into different feelings, vibrations with people, whatever, it doesn't matter. But then I find Jen has to check. Are you okay? You know who you are, right? You know what God's making you, right? Fix that first. Don't depend on everyone to give you your freedom. Let your freedom begin between you, the soul, and God, and practice this. And the more you practice, it start to become your nature. And once it becomes your nature, it will become your subtle aura message that you send out to people. And relationships and things can change that way very beautifully. You know, and we had a short little conversation before, and you mentioned something very deep where you expressed a question you have been given the freedom in a way you felt you have been given this gift of freedom by those mm -hmm. around you the institution the, our seniors certainly and mm -hmm. you were questioning yourselves as to whether you you were had a con caring or taking care of that freedom or respecting that freedom fully oh, what did you mean yeah. by that i wasn't questioning it actually um Many of us are given freedom, but sometimes we don't complement the freedom with enough wisdom to sustain it or to honor it. Freedom is not a small gift, I tell you. And whatever's been my karmic fortune and my karmic reality, I have been given a freedom to allow my creativity and feelings from God to keep flowing through me in the best ways that it's possible. And my nurturing of that freedom has been revealed to me that I have stayed true to certain choices. You might call them disciplines, but choices, my morning routine, whatever. Don't, don't get all nervous audience out there, but I used to work. I used to own two nightclubs. I used to go to bed at seven, eight o'clock in the morning. And here I am waking up at four o'clock in the morning, having a heart to heart conversation with God. So from nightclub to God, it's been an interesting journey, but I would get up in the morning and there was a freedom that I could do that. And I have this pattern, this, this, this timetable that I've been given by my elders and by the divine, follow that and you'll sustain your freedom. And when you don't have a lot of eyes watching you all the time, you have to keep that one eye looking at you. You have to sit right, eat properly, speak with respect to people, honor those that are in service with you, uplift humanity. And that's all I've wanted to see, Eric. And I've kept that responsibility to the freedom that I've been given. I've seen a lot of people have been given freedom and maybe they just don't have enough understanding of how precious it is. But unfortunately, they fall in prey to the lower, the lower vibration of their entity. And they've allowed themselves to not use that freedom as a strengthening force. It became more of a weakening force because there wasn't enough wisdom. So I've allowed the wisdom that I've been given through the Brahma Kamaris and my elders, the freedom that I've been given by God and my own destiny. And I brought them together and I says, may you two never have a disagreement. Keep going, keep going. And that's what I've done with that freedom. And I will request everyone to do the same because what I've seen on the other side of a lack of interior freedom is complications, disheartenment, arrogance, sadness, um, disillusionment. I don't want that for me and I don't want that for other people. So stay true to your pattern, stay true to your day-to-day -day routines 
and in between those timetables, create, do something different, but create a system, create a system that you stay true to throughout the day and don't break it. It'll sustain your freedom. That's what I feel. Mm. You mentioned a lot, you know, freedom being a gift, which is not a small thing. I don't know if people are pre I don't, I'm questioning even myself at the same time. I don't know if everyone appreciates or even is aware of having that gift and how much they are taking care of it. You know, even in Canada, we are a land that should mm -hmm. be considered free. Uh, in many, many ways, freedom of speech, freedom of, you know, uh, action in terms of uh, rights, human rights, and so many aspects of freedom. And it's interesting, I'm wondering if sometimes we, we don't appreciate enough mm -hmm. the freedom we have already, and we keep searching for another freedom that uh, we need to, to create, I don't know. Yeah, it's a appreciation great question. of freedom is quite an interesting concept, something to meditate on, appreciating the freedom we have. There's a saying in our daily teachings of the Brahma Kumaris, um, those who live by the Ganges don't appreciate it as much as those who visit the Ganges. And a few years ago, America went through great turmoil. It still is, but it's leveraged out a little bit. And all you heard from Americans were, I'm moving to Canada. I'm moving to Canada. And I used to think about that. Okay, what, now that you've used the country, you want to go to another country and use that country too. I feel like if we all recognize that we have responsibilities where we are, is that we will be able to put in what's needed. And you are absolutely right. Is it that we really don't value the freedom that we've been given? And um, we have traveled to so many countries, Eric, all over the world. And when you go back home to Canada, I'm sure you feel like, oh. and then when I come back to America, sometimes I feel, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but you know you know we can still sleep with our doors unlocked here you know there is still that sense of safety and freedom and i just wish for everybody to do the inner work and uh, to have a deep relationship with god very privately you don't have to define your god in your religion because you can't squeeze him in a religion god is too big for that but Find that space. There's something you said a long time ago, which I think you took from our, our senior uh, sister Mohini, that there's a little yagya, there's a little space in your heart, your little temple. There's a church, there's a mosque, there's a religious place, there's a sacred place in your heart. And wherever you go, you live from that place. I think that's a great freedom. And I've always found that's why the freedom of the heart for me was a very crucial one. Yeah. And I felt very often that, um, you know, it's the wounds in the heart that I inflicted sometimes on myself that stopped me from feeling the freedom. Because freedom is a perception, but ultimately it should be a feeling. Like you said, when, you know, we arrive in Canada or arrive somewhere, you feel, okay, wow. Or for me, the image, I'm in touch with nature and I want to scream of happiness, my freedom. It's a feeling. And I think that um, the heart being free, you know, one day our friend Denise, that is also regular on these uh, series, described to us something that made us squeak a little bit and she said many of us have a little barbed wire stuck in our heart mm -hmm. and it's very <laughs> delicate to remove that and we all felt oh <laughs> what are you talking about and i could relate to it so well because you know certain wounds are so difficult to remove mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. conflicts we had with people uh, very often close ones parents 
husband and wife. I, I can't understand sometimes how two people can express themselves, express to each other their love for many years. You are mm -hmm. the star of my life. You are the one. And they're more French than me at that time, I'm sure. <laughs> and then sometimes something happened and they almost kill each other mentally or spiritually or physically. Yeah. And they hate each other. And they think, wow, what happened? You know, like that heart got so damaged, so hurt. And I really feel for these friends of mine sometimes or people who, who are suffering so badly because of relationships and it's like they're in jail they're really their heart is back in a stone age in jail and to me it's like how can i help them regaining freedom in the heart so they don't suffer in that mm -hmm. relationship and and yes a freedom of the mind freedom of the heart maybe we can i know we have a few more minutes before we maybe meditate together and with the with everyone but i don't know for you what will what would you see to be some of the causes that really refrain us from feeling or being that freedom or accepting the freedom given to us. Mm. I could say a lot, but um, mm. I feel that um, we're, we're fantastic people. I feel everyone is absolutely perfect even in their pain and sorrows. I think that for me, how I've been able to remove the barbed wire from my beautiful heart is that I've accepted that I had a contract with the soul. And either this contract has come to a close. For some reason, it's just done. It's sort of like a subscription. When the subscription is over, it's just over. So I don't need anything more from them. But the issue is, can I maintain good wishes and pure feelings? And that's the important aspect, which I think people haven't heard enough to recognize the next, the next stage or the next scene in their life after the marriage is dissolved or the, or the intense relationship between you and another or with your company or your spiritual practice, that my contract is coming to an end. I see that. But when it does, can I still just give my good wishes and pure feelings? There are no movies that shows that too much. So we don't have that knowledge of that. We don't have the freedom to think like that afterwards, except, oh, this contract is done. Look what you did. You had that moment. This was the reason. This wasn't in alignment. Okay, I guess it's time for us to say goodbye. I say this easily to you, but when your emotions and everything is caught up, forget it. It's hell. But when that passes, you must come to that state of wisdom because freedom is your gift and a privilege and something that is innately your possession. But you forget it or you've compromised it so my contract is done with you get it but for me to be free i've got to give you my blessings even if i'm not with you and that's what i would do and that's what i have done so i go through the messy experiences with them i go through the hurt i try to find my plies to pull the, 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 the wire from my heart. And when I'm done, in order to heal me, I have to bless them. Because I found that when I can't give them my good wishes and pure feelings, I'm in a prison, I'm in a bondage, I'm in a deep bondage. And how awful of me to do this to me now. I have nobody to blame. So my blessings and my good wishes is my protection and my freedom. Does I think it's the perfect way to conclude our little conversation and listen to see if there are any questions. But I love this expression. I looked at my beautiful hearts <laughs> and then the contract with the soul. 
I think this is an ending with the blessings. I think if we can all just remember those three expressions, my beautiful heart, it should be the title of a movie, actually, my beautiful heart, mm. contract with the soul, and then give blessings. Um, I think that's it. Manoj, I think the bouquet is completed on our side. <laughs> <laughs> Unless anyone has questions. I think Jenna has made my plant even. There must be more coming up. <laughs> I think it's coming up still behind me. So what it's do you your suggest? love, Eric. It's your love that's flourishing that tree. Well, thank you for generating that love. Gen generating that love. <laughs> You're generating. <laughs> <laughs> Manoj Bai, thank you for always bringing us together and these values sessions, I don't know about Eric, but they remind me and, and show me so much of the stuff that God's energy is doing through me and working through me. And I appreciate you and the team making this opportunity open up for me and for others. And it's truly our blessing. So thanks to Manoj and everyone in the values team for sticking and making this happen all the time. So thank you, both of you. We have 15 minutes for question and answer. Is that OK? Sure. Yeah. And if there are no questions, we're happy to meditate together. <laughs> yeah. Fine. There are quite a few questions. The first question is for both of you. Uh, what is the difference between freedom and liberation? Because in the spiritual context here at Brahma Kumaris, a lot is spoken about liberation in life, particularly. If I can say it in Hindi, Jeevan Mukti. So is there a difference between freedom and liberation? Eric, could you try that I would one? Go, I would go first as, um, you know, on a very practical level. If I'm in jail, I first will have liberation and then I will enjoy my freedom. But if I'm a spiritual person in jail, I may accept my, liber my jail status and choose to be free in the jail and wait for liberation. <laughs> so they can be both, mm -hmm. you know, intertwined, but they're both a different dynamic of my experience uh, of my relationship with the outside world and my inner world. And so I think for me, I aspire to complete my liberation and to fulfill my freedom. They're both uh, working together because until I'm liberated, I cannot experience freedom. So freedom for me is a stage of being and liberation will be for me a stage of becoming, a stage of mm -hmm. processing. And I would feel that both are complementary because if I'm going to Cuba next week, I'll be in Cuba for the next week, mentally. And I'll only be in Cuba, I mean, I'm saying Cuba, I could be in India or somewhere, but I like uh, the beaches in Cuba. So for one week, I'll be anticipating being on the beach, you know, so I'll be already there mentally, but I'll really experience it when I'm there. So a liberation is really when this is happening, but the stage of freedom normally is experienced when you are liberated. But sometimes we have to pre-visualize to experience it beforehand. So my freedom at the moment is sometimes temporary, but it's a practice of a stage that I wish to accomplish on a permanent basis. But for that, I need to be liberated from my own vices, negativity, old patterns, thoughts that you were mentioning, Jenna. That's how I would, have free, I would see it. Yeah, I would go to another question because I think Eric did perfect. <laughs> right. So if if I would just want to put it, it was a quote where which I read, and you as rightly you said that liberty is the right to choose, as you were speaking about the jail coming out from there, and freedom is the result of the right choice. So very beautifully explained. Mm. Uh, so let me just ask Sister Jenna this question because she touched upon this freedom in service. So a question is that nowadays in the Brahma Kumaris, we are free to do a lot of service. And some people go overboard and without informing their seniors, they just do some service. <laughs> and probably that may amount to some disservice in one way. 
So uh, what is the best way to uh, understand this freedom in service? Because people should not take it in the wrong context. Correct. So when I spoke about my freedom in service, it did entail me communicating to our higher ups and our regional office of what we were going to do. So everyone was always informed. Now, did they get involved? Did they get engaged? Did they support? That's a different topic. That's a different situation. But I think that as you develop on this spiritual journey and the spiritual path, there breeds an element of trust or safety in the choices that you make. And so one of the important reasons why we simply just check in with each other, because it's such a large organization, you just want to be able to get the support or some little guidance or information that can help you to make the service that you're doing easier. Now, if you're breaking away to do service because you're not getting along with the main instrument or you're not liking that center and that place and you want to go out and do something on your own, then that the service that it creates, one, is within you. Your conscience will know. If you're really quiet, you will feel it that what you're doing could be done better. And you don't want to bring that energy into the choices that you make. The second thing is, if others in the organization hear what's going on, and it seems like it's not connected to the larger picture, they get concerned about you. So then you're pulling their attention away from them being the bigger job. So then that's another form of disservice. The third thing is, if you speak ill and say unkind things, about the reason why you're doing this service or you're breaking to do this, then of course you know it's going to create a burden on you and also put you in a prison. So yes, definitely, it's a communication. Some of us have very good communication skills. Some people that you communicate with might not have very strong communication skills. That is a challenge. But at least if you just write an email, at least inform folks, your mind is at ease. They might not ever respond, but at least do your due diligence and say, here's what I think is happening. Here's what's come in front. This is what we're planning to do and just make sure you have full support. So there are different factors. You just don't go out and just do service. <laughs> there has to be a reason behind everything that's unfolding for you. And each soul has a different part to play. Whoever asked that question, I just want you to know where I'm concerned. I'm raised in America. My father's Indian. My mother's African. I've seen the world. I've had a lot. When I came to Baba, there was a different interpretation of how I saw this. But the most important thing is my purity and my ability to give the most that I can for myself. And so I think it's important that you are also aware of who you are and really what you feel the call is that God has through you. So Baba can work through me to be in the Lokic world very comfortably because he trusts me. He knows I'm not going to break my mariadas. I'm not going to break my principles, that I'm out as Baba's instrument. When I come back, it is sustained, it's taken care of, we move on to another assignment. So know yourself and don't be influenced by looking at other people's service and competing or thinking you can do that too or you can do better. You know, I started this radio show, America Meditating. It's been almost 15 years. We started it because of Sister Gator's cancer. It's become a great success. Can I tell you how many souls have tried podcasts or radio stations or I've heard heard them, they've not come and asked me how I've done it, but they've gone around to my team and asked, how am I doing it? And I always wonder why they're doing it like that. Just ask me and I'll be happy to guide. If your motive for your service has impurity in it, is mixed with I, me, or mine, it is a disservice. And I think that's important for everyone to recognize because we're revealing God, and this is high, and this is huge. So just make sure your heart is clean. 
Amazing. This answer is a big bombshell, I must say, but it is it is the need of the hour, what you said. I really like that answer. And I think whoever has asked this question will get it like your answer was quite elaborated. And the next question is for Brother Eric, because he mentioned that in the sharing when he was doing that. Uh, the brother is asking that I am really uh, in a lot of bondage and hostage, as you mentioned, of my past sanskars, of my past habits. And I'm just not able to get rid of those past sanskars. Again and again, I tend to use them. And rather, they use me. Those sanskars uh, go overboard and I start using them. So how can I really get freedom from these or liberation from these bondages of my past sanskars? Well, first I feel for the person asking because this is the most, um, I would say, crucial part of our journey for some of us. And I totally identify with having strong sanskaras that just don't go away. <laughs> and I've complained to the seniors. I've questioned Rajoga as an effective method. I call my seniors and says, does it really work, this Raja Yoga? Because I'm still stuck with this. And I put makeup, cover it up, hide it, change the name, pretend it doesn't exist, ignore it, it still comes back. So I totally relate to the question. And there are many different aspects to do that because it's like curing a very serious disease. It's not just one little pill a day, but it may have many, many factors. So it's a kind of thing when the very strong personality trait is tenacious and doesn't go away. Then for me, the approach is to apply different aspects altogether. It's like a, if your enemy is strong in a war, you have to surrender it by on different fronts. And I would say, in essence, uh, not, never to give up. Never, ever to give up. My mentor in me, <laughs> I don't know if I should, I should share it publicly sometime, but uh, now, but sometimes my mentor is, I don't remember the exact quote, but apparently the one who invented the bulb had to try, I don't know, a thousand times. And it was the 1001 time that he succeeded i don't know maybe wrong but something like that and i kept telling myself okay not today fine i was caught again with my old tendency okay fine i don't give up i'll i'll make it next time will work and if not next time the falling time will work i so never ever to give up have faith in god that he's not going to give up either God is never going to give up on me. I asked him if he wanted to. I gave him freedom <laughs> to give up on me. And says, take another customer. I'm hopeless. You know, I'm not going to, you, you bet wrong on that particular horse. I'm not going to make it. Take somebody else. He's still there every morning saying, I'm here. Can I help you? I said, still there. You didn't give up on me. So I don't give up. God doesn't give up. And then the courage. You know, it's just a mantra. It was the first blessing I received in the spiritual journey that I'm a soul with a lot of courage. And I said, when I heard that, no way. That's exactly what I don't have is courage. But I got it as a blessing. And for strange reason, every time I felt like giving up, I remembered that thought that I felt was given to me by the divine. You know, it says, you have courage, and because you have courage, God will help you. So I've always men remembered that, and I've always felt, okay, at the moment I feel overwhelmed with my disappointment that I'm not succeeding. My sanskara is still stronger than I thought, but I'm not going to give up. And if I have a little bit of courage, the help I will receive will be a thousandfold. And it always, always happened that way. So I kept going, and I can only share my experience that maintaining certain principles, certain practices, and maintaining the faith that I can make it, I can do it. I know the sanskar is deep, 
is strong, is vicious, is mean, is violent, is hurting me, I'm not going to give up. And I have faith. One day I will succeed. And sometimes I keep changing the song towards me and I say, Eric, you see, it's happening. Before I used to sing the song, you know, it's not happening. Now I'm singing the song. It is happening. I'm getting more and more free. Look, today's better. You can do it. Come on, you can do it. And I play tennis and I love taking tennis lessons because in tennis, my teacher proved me that even at my age, I can still change old habits. And I felt if I can do it on a tennis court, I'm going to do it in my inner tennis court. And so never give up courage, God's help, and just keep going and knowing that um, the law says, if you are really courageous, God will help you and you'll be successful. So I'm still working on it. And so I encourage whoever has a question, just never give up, keep going. And one day those old sanskaras, they will have to give up, you know, they will have to say goodbye. Mm -hmm. But until they're holding on to me, they're also my best teachers. Because I keep having the faith that because of that weakness, I will develop my higher strength. And we always say, if your weakness is, let's say, um, lying or not being honest, that means your true, eternal, highest quality is honesty. And that weakness is helping you to achieve that quality to the highest extent. So if there's impurity in me, it's going to teach me to become number one in purity. I believe that. Do you agree, Jenna? Did I say okay? <laughs> no, you're <laughs> so right. Correct my answer. <laughs> you're so right. And I was thinking of the soul who asked as well that sometimes we pressure ourselves to become so perfect that the pressure of the resistance of whatever those vices are that are stimulating, it, it really doesn't do well for the soul on the inside. And one time I remembered going through something and I sat in Baba's room and I said, Baba, Baba, I'm not what they think I am. And Baba said to me, don't worry, I don't need you to be perfect now, just be honest. And through your honesty, you become perfect. So I think just the person asking the question is another step you've just taken towards your perfection. And so again, yeah, everything Eric said was spot on, but don't go forcing yourself too much to get to this ideal goal that you think you're supposed to get to and disregard the beautiful steps that you're taking to get there. Some of them will be messy, and some of them won't be. It's a part of the journey. But don't ever, ever look at yourself as if you're not worthy or good enough or pure enough for this path. It is a part of the journey to have messy times. Find good friends and elders you can talk to. Speak about it. There's a reason why God found you. Don't let it pass you by by getting stuck and forcing yourself to be something you're just not ready to sit in yet. It's a journey. It's a journey. Keep going. Amazing, beautiful answers by both of you. And that takes me to the second quote, which I was wanting to ask, but Brother Eric has already hit it spot on. And when he said courage, so the quote says that the secret to happiness is freedom. I'll repeat the secret to happiness is freedom and the secret to freedom is courage so if you have courage you are free to do things but uh, i think the time is just going off i'll just ask another question written in the chat box speaking of freedom particularly in the west because in india it's very easy for us to wear the white clothes and follow all the proper codes of conduct have all the parts of the bodies covered but in the west when people come to centers and they are all in the Western, particularly the US, Canada, you all both stay in those areas. So uh, when we speak about freedom, how should we tell them about the code of conduct? Are they free to wear whatever they like? Or do, should we tell them yeah. something? 
To be honest with you, I don't get caught up in all those limited ideas of how they should dress, what they should dress. Everybody here wears their whites and their quarters. People come in, they're quite fine. Uh, maybe my only request is, if it's possible, could you wear whites on Thursdays or Sundays? It's an option, but everybody respects the space. Everybody respects it. So I don't necessarily go too much in those limited kind of uh, do's and don'ts of the BK world. I think it turns too many people away and it's not healthy, but I think that when people gain consciousness, they will automatically make the choice that supports the respect of our environment and our space. So sometimes I leave it up to people to make that choice and they usually always make the good choice. Eric? Yeah, no, I agree. We used to be very a little bit uptight about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah not ago. anymore. We used to be a little fanatical club of uh, dress codes, you know, and every code has to be observed uh, <laughs> strictly and fanatically. And I remember <laughs> even myself, you know, when uh, a long time ago when I was... We all were like that. <laughs> center ...in charge and I was responsible to uphold highest disciplines in a center. <laughs> and the woman came, a young girl came with, um, I think, minimum amount of clothes on the body. So it was really, really minimum, <laughs> barely enough for. And so I rushed on her with a white shot <laughs> to wrap her up <laughs> quickly. <laughs> and it says, you will be more comfortable like this. It's, it's cold, isn't it? I said, no, it's very warm. I said, no, it's cold. <laughs> and I put <laughs> the shawl on her <laughs> to cover up. <laughs> like she was like and I felt you know what are you doing Eric and um she was okay but I don't think I would do that again um no, I, I think if either. we see people with a higher spiritual vision you know this is our problem for me that in the past I was uncomfortable with how people would uh, dress and I had to question my why am I uncomfortable and today if I really see them with a higher spiritual vision, like Jenna said, exactly. I mean, everything is okay. You know, they will align. There's no need to tell people. We used to jump on people when they sat on the wrong side of the room as if they did a terrible crime. You know, <laughs> don't sit there, sit there. And then they will be terrified as if they did something so wrong. So we're just increasing guilt and shame for no, for silly thing. We have enough guilt and shame with <laughs> all past things let's, let's not think but i think we've been we've become much better now in the west and we're much more easygoing and you know if someone comes in bikini in the center i will tell them nicely you know there's a nice shawl <laughs> you can wear it'll be more comfortable for you but we don't see anyone coming like this you know times have and changed what, a lot and it's uh, and it's lot. good yeah and it's not just anymore about what you're dressing anymore whoever asked the question i just want you to know there are many, many souls who are very sincere on the spiritual journey, better yogis than even I am. And they, they're not wearing a sari. Their hair is not in one. But you can see from their behavior and their mannerisms and their in logic setting, they're true effort makers. So it's not all what you see that really matters it's the energy that the person brings in the space you know it's fantastic so it's the dress of the mind how is my mind dressed that's important rather than the physical body thank you so yeah. much and we have just really enjoyed I just don't want to leave both of you but time is coming <laughs> to a close thank I you. Would request dr ashok mehta to please propose the vote of thanks before we go in the meditation mode yeah thanks Thank you very much, Jana Ben and Eric Bai, for making freedom a multifaceted game. <laughs> uh, there are many, many areas. And if you live in a, a different society, for example, here the economic freedom, financial freedom, societal freedom uh, is also very, very important. Uh, most, of the, the, most of the time we talk of political freedom, we talk of bondages, of karmic bondages, and freedom from uh, our weaknesses. But I think uh, when you look at the world today as what's happening around, 
I think the personal freedoms of people are being taken away, like what see, we see in Afghanistan or uh, the other, the entire country's freedom is being taken away, for example, in Ukraine. So I think that uh, freedom has a very, very wild sense. From our point of view, from a spiritual point of view, I think karmic bondages are very important. And we need to cut those karmic bondages which are uh, holding us to the uh, lower frames of uh, from human to the uh, the highest devata of gods and goddesses. So I think uh, what you have covered is so beautiful. We enjoyed every bit of it. I think the story of the Buddhist bank was also very interesting. I think Eric, by your stories, some of them, they, they have a deep meaning and uh, we really will remember it for a long time to come. So thank you very much, both of you, for making it a very interesting dialogue. Om Shanti. Thank you, Dr. Mehta. Very appreciate it. <laughs> so thank you, Dr. Mehta. And over to you, Sister Anu, for the quick announcements. And even the photo, many people want the photographs. So we'll just take that before we go in the meditation mode. Over to you. Okay, Thanks. thank you, Brother Manoj. And yes, as uh, Dr. Mehta said, it was very empowering. And both of you took us deep into within us to check actually are we free. So thank you so much. And very quickly, I'll announce the upcoming programs. That's uh, as we always do. After one week, we'll have the workshop uh, on uh, freedom. Uh, so the first hour will be the experiential exercises. And the second hour, again, um, another deeper insight into freedom by Brother Marcelo. He is the national coordinator um, of Ramakumaris in Colombia. So it's happening next week, Saturday, 17th December. Um, morning 6 30 a.m for west coast canada us and that is 9 30 a.m east coast and india time 8 p.m so please note and our um, next session on values for life series is episode 55 on cooperation sahayog for that we'll have sister judy rogers from peace village Literature Center, New York. She'll join us from there. So it's happening after two weeks from today, Saturday, 24th, December, morning, 7 a.m. for West Coast, U.S. Canada, and 10 a.m. East Coast, U.S. Canada, 8.30 p.m. India. So that's Christmas Eve. I'm sure all of us will take advantage and join. And you will get um, information about all these programs and joining info on our websites. That's vihasa.in and vancouver.brahmakumaris.ca and all the videos, including today's, on our YouTube channel. That's Vyasa India and Brahma Kumaris Vancouver YouTube channel. Thank you, everyone. And yes, we can take the photo, if everybody can open their video, with our very, very special Sister Jenna and Brother Eric. Everybody ready? Mm -hmm. So whoever, they open the video so late, Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I got it. Thank you. Over to you, Brother Man. Yeah, so let's go in the meditation mode. Uh, will it be Drishti or some commentary? What do you all prefer? Uh, we'll, uh, we'll play a meditation um, video, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. And, and if you'd like that during the meditation video, the sound can go on, but you could just spotlight everyone's Drishti if you'd like. It's up to you. Yeah, so that's perfect. So I know, sister, we can spotlight uh, sequentially everyone. And I think some brother Santosh would play the meditation video for us. Yeah, so that's correct. Fine. Correct. Thanks, everyone. As I sit here in quiet reflection, I'm reminded how my thoughts create my reality. I've accepted that I am what I am because of what I think. So what if for this moment I choose 
to let go of my various attachments to physical forms that have limited my potential and my capacity. What if I chose to be free from limitations of thinking? So just for a little while, I invite you to take a deep breath. Inhale. And exhale. And imagine for a moment, what if I no longer had an attachment to my name? How would that feel? What if I let go of the awareness of the gender? What if I let go of the roles that I play? the titles that I own. What if I decided to release thinking of myself as religion, a language, a nationality, What if I choose to just let go of the name, gender, role, title, religion, language, nationality, and let go of the awareness of the body? How would I feel? Who would think of me in this awareness? And who would I think of? I would think of God. And God's remembrance would fall on me. And I, the living soul, be completely free. Let me just sit in this moment for a little longer. And just be free. Now gently bring back the awareness of your gender, language, nationality, title, role, name, religion, whatever. Bring it back to your awareness and see if you can bring the experience of freedom and peace as you go out into the world and play your various parts. Om Shanti. Om Shanti. Om Shanti. Thank you so much, both of you. Thank you, Manoj Bai and the team. It's been great. Thanks, Eric. Love Thank you, Jenna. Thank you, everyone. Lots of love and warm greetings for the Christmas season as well and the new year. So from the heart to everyone's hearts.
Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone.